right, so here we go. Uh, we're going to look at intrinsic carrier concentrations of, of states that are not specifically doped, and we're looking at the occupancy of sort of naturally occurring semiconductors, if you will. All right, so we'll need to uh, derive a Fermi integral and the law of mass action. Let me dive in. So we have started the discussion on the Fermi Dirac distribution by looking at the density of states. In the previous section, we just looked at the electrons. But you can clearly see if we now introduce the Fermi function and give it some finite spread in uh, uh, temperature distribution. So at a finite temperature, uh, we would uh, calculate an electron distribution that might look like this. So. Uh, numerically speaking, you multiply the density of state G C of E by the Fermi function F of E, and that gives you a rising uh, component, like the density of states, that is multiplied by a decaying solution from the Fermi function, so then you fill in a number of electrons here in red. Okay. You can imagine that you can, so if you wanted to know the number of electrons in total in the system, you would integrate this distribution from the conduction band edge where states occur, so here is EC, up to some top of the uh, density of states. Uh, we know that the density of states is in a finite band and you would stop your integral there. Now, for holes, you do kind of the opposite. Holes occupancy would be 1 minus f, as plotted here. These functions meet exactly at the Fermi level, where they're both 1 half. And you uh, get a similarly distributed uh, carrier concentration for the holes. Same approach, and you would calculate the hole distribution on a total number of holes from the top of the valence band down to the bottom where the band ends, okay? So this is the numerical approach to calculate up uh, an electron distribution, uh, a total number of electrons. So now you see why this density of, of states as a concept is so important. This allows us to um, numerically treat the number of states that are available within a sliver of energy and the occupancy is determined by a Fermi function, and the product of that is the number of electrons at a given energy level. And as you turn that into a continuous distribution, we can do integral uh, calculations to compute the number of electrons in the system. All right, so let's do this here for the number of electrons in a conduction band in a 3D solid. So we'll plug in the GC that we know goes as proportional of square root of e. It has a function of, uh, is a function also of the electron effective mass and has some cofactors of um, uh, h bar cubed and pi in it. And we multiply by 2. And that is for spin up and spin down electrons in this case. The Fermi distribution is 1 over 1 plus beta e minus ef. And now we integrate this up to a total uh, top of the band. All right, now, if we uh, assume that the bands are truly, by assumption, EC equals h bar square k square over 2m star, where it's truly just a simple parabolic dispersion, E and k, and we start from zero here, then uh, we can just assume that there is no top of the density of states. And what we really assume is that, the, that pretty much uh, when the band truly ends, it's already, the occupancy is already zero. It will not falsify too much the calculation. Or the temperature is not too high, or the band is actually not too narrow, which would be like this. So we assume that we have wide bands. So this wide band assumption will be a word that you might find in the literature quite a bit. So that's the wide band assumption. And what we do is we replace the top of the uh, uh, um, integral, the top of the band, by infinity. 
And then you can carry out these um, uh, integrals uh, explicitly and it's um, parameterized in a, in a so-called uh, Fermi integral function, okay? All right, and you introduce a coefficient called NC, capital NC, that goes with uh, uh, the effective mass, and it goes with beta, which is 1 over kT to the th uh, 3 half power. And this Fermi function is somewhat of a, a complicated beast. It is, um, you can tabulate it, you can run a computer program on it. It's not a simple analytical result that would result in a, a particular value. You end up having to do this integral uh, for any different values of eta. And eta is really the, the content of the exponential, which is EF minus EC over KT. Okay, so beta is 1 over kBt. All right, so this is somewhat of a beast to deal with here, this Fermi integral of type 1 half. All right, so in the olden days, what you would do is you would chart up and calculate this uh, numer uh, by, by hand calculation and tabulate this function, and you would plot it like this here, and on a log scale, as a function of eta here, it will be roughly linear for uh, negative coefficients here. And as eta if, as is getting to be larger, uh, it starts to taper off. Now, a very good approximation to this function is e to the n c, uh, eta c like this. Okay, and that will particularly work well for any um, eta that is less than minus 3. Okay, so you can replace this function here with nc times n, uh, e to the nc. Okay, so that is a good approximation. As you can see on these curves, they virtually lie on top of each other for uh, small values, small negative values of eta here. Okay, so you can replace this complicated beast here that includes a tabulated function uh, with an expression like this uh, that is just a simple complex exponential. Okay, for holes you can derive the very same thing and it looks like this. So you end up having a sim single number that uh, determines the number of electrons times some exponential that depends on the Fermi function and really the distance of the Fermi, uh, Fermi, fun uh, Fermi energy from the conduction band or the f Fermi energy of the valence band. Right. So really what you have here is Boltzmann statistics. You threw away the Fermi piece and that works well if you're working in the tails of the Fermi function. And that is true for non-degenerate systems. And degenerate systems, we in general talk about when the Fermi function gets closer to the conduction band edge out here, or even out here where the Fermi function is in the conduction band, say, the Fermi level. All right, so what we've done here is, what we've done is really collapse our carrier distribution really into delta functions, where the whole distribution now is some n times nc times some complex exponential, and for the holes, the same thing, okay? And where did this come from? Well, we, we really have collapsed these complex-looking uh, carrier distributions and collapsed them into delta functions. And that's a very handy concept to have if you really don't care about the details of what's happening up here at higher energies. And all you care about is really the total number of electrons that are at a, in a system for a given Fermi level and for um, a given conduction band or a valence band. All right, so there's no more energy distribution. You collapse it into a single delta function. That means Conceptually, you collapse all the states into a single level 
that is exactly at the conduction band edge. And that turns out to be rather handy and you kind of start to forget about all of this complicated density of states. And you can carry in a semi-classical way, you can carry out calculations of electron densities throughout the structure and that will be part of the next uh, segment that we'll talk about. But now first let's go in and look at the so-called law of mass action. And what this entails is that the product of n times p, so any number of electrons and any number of uh, holes, uh, works out to be nc times nv times e to the minus beta band gap. Okay, And that is true for any um, Fermi function, for any distribution of carriers like this. Okay. This is a very useful balance equation and we will use it often for all kinds of calculations. So we'll, we'll go back to understanding a relationship between the number of available electrons and holes. Okay, so let's derive from there. Where would the Fermi level be for intrinsic semiconductors if this holds? We're defining the intrinsic number of electrons in the system as Ni and we derive it from uh, this expression here, where um, both holes and electrons are at the level of Ni. Okay, So we can resolve this for Ni, and we define the Fermi function to be the so-called intrinsic Fermi function, given that you have no doping, etc. And from there, we can figure out that the uh, intrinsic energy level or the, Fermi, uh, the intrinsic Fermi level is roughly at half gap and it has a correction to it. Now if Nc were to be Nv, that means the conduction and the valence band are exactly the same, then the ratio of that would be 1 and the log of 1 is 0. So there's no cor uh, correction. If uh, the number of uh, states at the valence band is larger than the number of uh, states in the conduction band edge, this term becomes positive, so becomes greater than this. If this is greater than a 1, then this log becomes uh, positive. So you correct up the intrinsic level and it goes up a little bit here. So if Nc and V is larger than NC, the correction 1 over 2 beta becomes greater than 0 and you float up the Fermi level a little bit. And if NV is less than NC, then this term becomes less than 0 and the Fermi function floats, the Fermi level floats down a little bit. So what this does, it basically balances the charges in the valence band and the conduction band to have exactly the same uh, number of electrons and holes. So it, ma uh, it, it satisfies the law of mass action. All right, so we've reached uh, the state uh, of the art now where we can occupy states in, in a density of states. We derive the Fermi function uh, in multiple ways. We have the law of mass action here, as indicated like this, and we calculated the intrinsic Fermi level in a semiconductor. And we have collapsed all distributions of electrons and the distributions of holes into delta functions. So from here, we can begin to uh, calculate some uh, device uh, occupancies in realistic devices, and we can study how these carriers interact with it within multiple bands. So what's, that's what's going to come up next, which is really uh, uh, beginning to look at transport in these, in these structures. And uh, first of all, we have to get some electrons in the system. So with that, I thank you very much, and I'll see you at the next section.